Well, hi, everybody. But I'm so, up here. I think everybody knows me already, so I won't introduce myself. Sure you will. Um, again. Okay, I'm Bob. <laughs> Bob Franklin. Anyhow. Yeah. How are we? Um, so, <clears throat> I do rings. Um, and I do sets as well. And we do bracelets. And I do pendants on occasion. And I turn everything else too. But in the meantime, um, most of you know that we make and sell hybrid blanks. And I love the combination of the hybrid blanks with jewelry. Um, I think it really accents it well. And I can pass this one around. This is, um, my, my wife had the other half of that. That was a set. So when I do sets, they come out of a ring cube like this. If I was going to do a single ring, it would come out of a blank similar to this, this size. Um, and just for people, that, because they're going to be asking me anyway, sure. price each one of them. To so, well, price-wise, I if you're going to buy them through me, if you're going to get a hydro, hybrid blank through me, one of these would probably run mm, six, seven bucks. A cube, we're looking at probably 10 or 12, depending on what kind of burls in it. We stabilize all the burl that goes in them, uh, and there's a reason you want to use stabilized material in your rings and stuff. People have their hands in wet areas all the time. Um, I'm not advocating that you want to wash your hands with this ring on, but you're sweating. Um, you know, we're just in a wet environment a lot of the time. So wood shrinks and contracts and expands with moisture and if you don't stabilize the blank and it expands on the ring uh, on the core something's going to give and it's going to crack and you're going to ruin your piece that you turn so it's great to do these with stabilized woods or plastics um, of any kind you know uh, there's a difference between plastics and acrylics too the blanks you get here at woodcraft and rockler they're an acrylic blank that's, think of plexiglass. That's what that is. It's a type of plexiglass. It's a true acrylic. The blanks that anybody else does that they make uh, and you buy online um, from different people on different pages, uh, they're going to be a plastic of some sort. They're going to be either made with epoxy or PR, uh, polyester resin, or a urethane resin, which is what we use. Um, so they're less brittle than the blanks you get here. So keep that in mind if you're going up front here and you're buying pen blanks and you're going to make rings out of them <coughs> and you drop the ring, that's, the acrylics are real chippy. They, they like to shatter. Um, unlike our blanks, you know, if we drop one of these, it's going to survive. Uh, you go up there and buy one of their pen blanks and you do that to it and it's possibly not going to survive. Um, at least not a few times. Anyhow, I'm not here to talk about blanks. We're going to do the process of making rings up, and I wanted to show, the, the club wanted me to show how I make a matching set. Unfortunately, I don't have a matching set to show you. I ran out of time, and I've sold all my sets. So I can show you, uh, just pretend that this one's, this is orange, <laughs> and uh, it was turned out of the same blank. So basically, I can cut, get two pieces out of one of these blanks. I can get a matching set out of it. And I can, at the end, if we have a little bit of time, I'll tell you how you could even go a step further. And you could get a pennant as well out of the one blank. So it could actually be all three pieces, and they would actually come out of this blank just like that. Their position, they're hiding in there just like that. So I can show you how you can get all three out of one. I don't know how much time we're going to, how far we're going to get. Um, I'll go as far as I can with the process. And if we have time, we'll try to get a pin and out too, but I don't think we're going to get that far. Um, talking about cores now and rings, let's go back to them and start with that. So these rings were turned. They don't have any kind of a metal core in them at all. 
There's nothing inside of them. They're just wood and, or wood and resin. Uh, this one happens to be a segmented piece, uh, just a scrap that I used. And I can tell you that if you don't support the ring and you wear it very long, it's going to break. Guaranteed. It's not very durable. It's not something that's going to hold up, not even if it's stabilized material. Not even if it's just plastic, because it's so thin, there's not enough material, and if you just tap it in the wrong, catch it on the right surface, it's going to break it, and it's going to shatter on you. So you're talking about non-laminated? Even non-laminated, yeah, just plain wood. Plain wood, plain wood or plain resin with no metal core in them at all. Okay. That's what I'm talking about there. So ideally, you want to put a core in them of some sort. The core is going to basically give you the strength to, um, I thought I had one out here. The core is going to give you the strength to help keep it all together. And usually I epoxy my blank onto the core. So I'll use a two part epoxy, like a 15 minute epoxy, and I would do that. For this demonstration we're going to use CA. CA works too, it's just, um, I think it gets a little bit more brittle. So there's two different cores, and I'll pass these around. Uh, one of them is a two-piece core, and the other is a single core. So you have your choice of doing them either one. With a single core, it's easier to make the ring. The core is a lot cheaper. Um, you can get on eBay and you can buy these 100 of them for 29 bucks. They say they're stainless, they come from China, who knows what they are. But they're cheap. Are they assorted sizes in that? They are assorted sizes, yeah. So they're cheap and I mean they're great for little ones, kids, you know, gifts, whatever. Uh, that, that's something that's, that's doable for them. And it's easy to make them. The, the only problem with these cores is that if you're wearing your ring, oh and there's the other core right there. <laughs> I thought I put my wedding ring back on. So if you're, um, if you're, if you're wearing these over time, um, you catch the edge just right and it can still chip out the wood or the acrylic or whatever you have, the plastic that's on here on that edge. It just takes you catching it on the right surface, the right way to break it. So it's not, as far as the durability, I would say it's not something you would want as your wedding ring. I wouldn't sell it as a wedding set. It's not that kind of a durable ring, in my opinion. Where the two-piece cord, um, let me pass that around. That's a single. The two-piece cord you can get in a number of different materials, uh, including stainless steel, titanium, um, ceramic. Um, what is it? Silver. Uh, I think gold too if you want to spend the money they're outrageous. So it's a two-piece core uh, and it's got a lip on each side that's going to actually support your your ring so you don't have that wood or that plastic going to the outside edge of your blank or your ring. So it's protected on the sides. And you, My wedding ring that's going around you'll see how that lip protects the sides and keeps it from chipping out on you. So these cores, I can tell you, these I buy mine through ringsupplies.com. The reason I buy mine through ringsupplies.com is for two things. One, they are great quality. They're probably the best quality kits, in my opinion, you can get. Um, and two, they carry my blanks. So I, I honestly, I'll put my business with them. Absolutely. The bangle guy carries these. You can get them through him if he has them in stock. Um, there's other suppliers too if you look. Uh, Craft Supplies has that ring that's going around now too. Uh, the stainless steel single core, you can get them I think for four something through Craft Supplies. So Wood Turner's catalog here on the internet. Um, and they're nice, they're, they're decent stainless. They're kind of rolled on the inside if you feel that core. <coughs> it's not sharp on the edges, so it's a decent quality core. Bad news is with these, if a stainless, this one in a stainless, which is what this one is, is 15, I think, and change, 14, 15 bucks. Um, plus they come from Canada. So you've got shipping. But he does run some specials on shipping. If you buy so much, you know, you can get shipping for free sometimes. 
Um, but they're a snap together core. They come in different widths. Same with the stainless ones. They come in different sizes and sometimes widths as well. Uh, these ones come in different widths and sizes. Uh, Ringsflies.com through him, they have them in half sizes too. So that's a benefit. Um, and they have the, the thinner ones. They call them by the they call it out by the millimeter. So like I think this is a four and this is a six. So you can see the difference in width. Uh, and I think there's one more even. I believe there's one more width. So you can get them in all different sizes. And we can pass them around. Um, just to get to show you as well, here's a stainless one piece core in a thin width. So that's a single piece. Um, you can pass these around too. So here's, a, here's one that's been made up with a single and then here is two just wooden ones and you can see how fragile they would. This one here I could squeeze it and I could break it, I guarantee it. Either one of them. Have you made any where you take like veneering and steam it and, and roll it around? I, I have not. But they do do that. So these cores, the, the two piece cores, you can glue them together just like they are and you can actually bend a piece of, steam a piece of veneer and bend it all the way around and cut it and glue it onto the core without even having, uh, without doing any turning at all. Just sanding it then and finishing it. Some guys do that. Uh, Ed and these guys do quite a few rings too and they, um, one of our good friends in, out of the Denver club is doing a lot of opal. So he'll take the two piece cores like this. They make some that are similar to the two piece. They'll have the, um, the rib on each side, but it's a single piece, but they use them just for inlay or veneers. So that core you can get, it's a single with sides and you can do like opal or crushed turquoise or whatever and you just glue it in place and then you turn it. So those are kind of neat too. So there's lots of options with it. Um, and there's all kinds of different finishes to do with them too and we can kind of touch base on that real quick and then we'll start doing some turning. But if I was going to do, and which we're going to do tonight, we're going to use a straight resin blank. So in this case, it's a urethane resin. It's pretty soft, and I'm going to put, just polish it out. We're not going to put any finish on it. Uh, I'll show you how to do an easy polish on just a plastic and get a pretty nice finish that's durable. Um, you're not going to scratch it. There's nothing to scratch off. Uh, if you scratch the acrylic, that's a pretty, pretty hard hit against a point or something to do it. Um, and you're going to damage anything at that point, no matter even if it's a CA finish. Now, if I'm doing a straight wood blank or a straight um, stabilized wood, then I would probably not just polish it out. I would probably lean towards putting a finish on it. And at that point, I would look at doing, uh, at the least, I would do a, um, yeah, a uh, friction polish. At the least, do a friction polish or go to the extent and do a CA finish on it. Be your choice if you want a more durable finish. If you're doing a hybrid blank of ours, we sell these as hybrids too, um, where they've got a piece of wood in them. Usually it's more than this, usually it's approximately half. So you get a piece of the wood in the, or the ring too. Um, then I would do a CA finish on it. So that would be my, my preferred choice for durability and to get the piece of high, stabilized burl to have the same luster as the plastic wood when I'm done. They'll have the same shine for the CA finish. Uh, if we have time, and I don't know that we do, I can show you how a quick way to do a CA finish on them too, but can you heat that gun up? Mm -hmm. um, so we have to attach it to the lathe, the blank first. Uh, whether it's wood or whatever you're using, if you're using a piece of wood or a piece of burl, you could easily mount it between centers, if it's big enough, mount it between centers and cut a tenon on it to fit in your chuck. So if you're going to do that, I would say you try to get a piece that's a couple inches thick to give yourself some working room so you're not getting into your chuck when you're turning it. In this case, 
the wider I make these blanks, the more expense is in them. So the urethane resonance for these is fairly pricey. So it's a difference of having, you know, for example, $8 in resin in it versus $16 in resin in it if I double it, which increases the cost. So I don't make them wider so that you can do that usually. Instead, we use a, just a glue block. So any kind of a jam chuck or a glue block, and we're going to actually glue it to it. Some people like two-sided tape, double-sided tape, Turner's tape. You could <laughs> use that too if you're confident with it. I find, and I use a lot of hot melt glue, regular hot melt glue, and the holding power of it is just way mind-boggling. It's, it'll blow you away how much it'll hold. Um, I, when I first started turning, I did a lot of, um, I didn't have a chuck, and I didn't have the money, and I um, managed to get a beel tap that fit my lathe, and I tapped waste blocks, and I used glue blocks. Everything was glue. I did lidded boxes uh, for two years probably just with the holding power of glue blocks. So they're pretty amazing, uh, the holding strength anyhow. So that's what we're going to do um, to, to attach it, is we're just going to use hot glue. Uh, it's just regular hot glue. In my case it is for wood because I bought it from a company that sells it, but you can go to Michael's or Hobby Lobby and the hot glue you get from them is just as good. Uh, this is just a waste block that I've had that I keep adding on to and keep using. Um, it's like glue gun is getting close. Move it on. Yep. I've marked center. Uh, we're going to use the lathe to clamp it. So I'm just going to hold it up there for right now. Make a divot in it. Doesn't have to be exactly perfect, but close. If you buy one of our blanks, um, whatever you're using, it doesn't matter. I, but I would suggest that you take it over to a belt sander or rough the back side up. So rough it up pretty good so that it's not smooth, especially if it's one of our blanks, because we cast uh, in PVC a lot of times, the cylinders, and they'll have a mold release on them that is an oil, and this won't stick to the oil. So just hit it with a belt sander and rough that back surface up. Even a wood blank I would do that too. And I'm just going to coat this whole back side good. Unplug that for me. Or just leave it there either way. And then very carefully not to burn yourself. And I'm not going to squeeze super hard because I can literally squeeze all the glue out. Just want enough pressure to hold it in place until it's glued. <coughs> sure, we're not going to drip on the lathe. And so this would be ready to turn now as soon as that glue dries. Um, maybe five, ten minutes, or not even that, three or four minutes. Um, I try to turn. Plastics are a different breed compared to wood. Um, you need to do a couple things with plastic blanks, and the bigger you go, the harder it is to do. One is that the bigger the blank is, the more chippy it's going to be until you get it roughed out, round. And you have to learn to overcome the chippiness right away. If I'm doing a big, I do dragon eggs, and I do four by six dragon eggs that are monsters, they're big, and are cannonballs. I've done orbs that were cannonballs, literally. And on them blanks, when I'm turning them, one of the things with plastics is that if you can increase your lay speed to a comfortable work speed as high as possible, that's safe, you can overcome a lot of the chippiness. The problem is when you have a big blank out there like that, it's not safe to run it at a high speed. So you have to run it at a low speed. So to overcome that, you learn how to get rid of the chippy part, um, cut it 
without getting chips. To do that, a couple things will do it. One is a slicing cut, rubbing the bevel with your bowl gouge. Um, in my case, it's a fingernail ground grind gouge. I can do rubbing the bevel and I can get rid of that chippiness. I'm actually cutting, I'm slicing. Um, the other, other way to do it is to, believe it or not, use a parting tool and just do little nibbles. So going in about a sixteenth at a time uh, on the side of the tool, not taking a full width, and you can get streams off of it too and not get chippy chip. The other way is if you have carbide tools and you're used to carbide, this is the easiest way for a lot of people. Uh, I use a slight radius square. So not the square one and not the round, it's a slight radius. And you want to come in just a little bit lower than center. And you want to actually have the handle up just a hair and you're going to come in underneath it and you're raising up into it. Raising up into the blank. And you'll see that I'm going to have cobwebs flying off of it doing that. And I'll show you what I mean by chippy right away. Um, you can start with that. Always try, uh, when you're roughing it out to begin with, to get it round. Anytime you can, it's good practice to leave the tailstock up for as long as you're turning. Uh, as long as possible with your turning. It's fairly close to round. So the chippy I'm talking about, um, if I come in with this ball gouge, low speed like I'm at, you hear that noise? That noise is chippy. And even though you see a few ribbons, I'm still getting some chip off. That's the noise. So that noise that you're hearing there, if you look and if you could zoom the camera in, you're going to see what looks like tons of little bubbles here. Mm -hmm. And it's not bubbles. It's that's chip out. That, that's called from not, that's coming from not slicing. So to get rid of that, get rid of that again, we're going to come in and we're going to increase the lathe speed. And now we're going to do a slicing cut. And that's what you want to see coming off of it. It's not chips and it's not powder. And like we talked, we can do that with a number of tools. Here's, here's the square. And then remember, I'm not even around yet, so it's kind of grabby right now. It's got to be easy. Now we're getting round. And the third way to do it is if you're finding it and you just can't get it to quit chipping, <clears throat> is to come in with a parting tool and I'm just nibbling 30 seconds at a time. And this right here is one of the fastest ways actually to bring it to shape. And the benefit is you get a nice fan going too. <laughs> That's a joke. But you get to take this tool and clean it off. <clears throat> so we've got it fairly round now. We can start actually shaping it. We need to face this side off a little bit. Let me go ahead and get it round round the rest of the way. Just straighten. I'm at low speed too. So if this was a pin, if you're doing one of our using one of our blanks and turning a pin, turn it your late speed as high as you can turn it safely. So I turn it full speed, 3,400 RPM or something is what I'm at with my lathe. Um, the smaller the diameter, the faster you need to turn. So if I'm doing a big four by blank, uh, this is a three inch. If I'm doing a four inch blank then I'm turning, um, you know, less than a thousand RPM. This here, we're at 1500. 
Um, and now that it's round, I could easily increase that a little bit and get a better cut even still. So, um, next thing is we need to go ahead and face this off and get it flat uh, and then parallel. To do that, the glue is set now. Move my elbow catcher. be cutting it about thinner here. And I use my bowl gouge, <coughs> but I use it as a scraper. So I'm using it as a shear cut. So that if you can see, I'm touching the top of the tool when I'm cutting with it. So I'm cutting with the bottom edge, but the top is almost, almost touching it. Facing it off, we're just trying to get it flat and get it all uh, uniform. And you see, we haven't even touched it here, it's still shiny. So, we need to go a little bit further. idea there is that we don't want it to be bowed out at all. Um, you'll learn to face things off later for a lot of different reasons. Um, so get used to when you're facing off trying to get it flat or concave just a little bit. Um, and there, there's reasons for having it concave. But uh, it'll just help you in the long run uh, with things down the road. So we've got it flat right now, so we know that this is going to be our leading edge of our bracelet and it's going to be the leading edge of our ring. And they're all in that same plane, so hopefully the colors are going to kind of blend through, at least on that side of them. Um, since this blank has some yellow going down, a yellow line going down in the middle, that line might still stay in the ring and in the bracelet. And that's the object we're trying to get, is the both that effect. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is work on the bracelet. We're going to start on it first. And we're going to actually... Uh, cut a bracelet out of it. Just a blank bracelet blank. So we want to come in here and we need to determine this size. And we want it to be a little bit smaller diameter than what we want our finish to be. The other option that we didn't talk about, uh, I prefer to do bracelets with no core. So with, with when we get to something this big, it's not like the ring where we're getting a sixteenth of an inch thick and trying to hold it together with that. This can be almost three sixteenths of an inch, so it's got a lot of strength left in it. So compared to that sixteenth. So I prefer personally to do my bracelet without a core. You can get cores. Here's one right here. This one is a brass core. It came from PSI. It's one of the cheapest ones you can get. They're like 18 bucks. It does not snap together. It doesn't have a lip. They just butt together. So you have to be exactly on on your width. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a seam here. You're going to see a gap if you're too wide or you're going to see a gap here if you're too loose. So it has to fit the core perfectly. Otherwise, you've got a gap somewhere. So I don't like it for that. The second reason I don't like it is because I know for a fact that they have these in three platings. Um, copper, gold, and they call it faux rhodium. 
The faux rhodium, I know for a fact, is plating. And if you hit this with sandpaper, you burn through the plating on it and it looks like crap. So you can't do any kind of a finish while it's on here. You can't sand it at all. And I'm almost positive that if we did the same thing with this brass one, that it would be a different color underneath too. And same with the copper, probably. Um, I haven't tried them. I just bought this to bring it. Uh, the Bengal guy has these as well. And from what I hear, they are a snap together. So I, I don't know. I haven't bought them from them. Okay. And I think they may be stainless too. So they might be better quality. Here's a, our secretary, president slash over there, brought this one in. Uh, that is one that's done with a core. Is, was this from the Bengal guy or was this from? So this is a Bengal guy core. Um, and did it snap together then? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, you can see he did a really nice job on it. This is a decent core. I think I would probably be inclined to use this that's, core. That's the same thing I have. I got yeah. it at the symposium a couple of years ago. Right. Problem is the Bengal guy doesn't have them half the time. I've been to his site half a dozen times and they're not in stock. They're never in stock. It's like I don't know what's going on with that, but I think they're great if you could get them from them. Yeah, you can pass these two. So I'm going to do this without a core. Um, or attempt it. So we need to size it. I know that my wife likes a two and five eighths in sight diameter on hers. So that's kind of my set number when I'm doing them for her. So I'll just use that. They do have them, those, uh, those cores, they have them in three different sizes a lot of places. So you can get a small, a medium, and a large. Depending on your hand, on your arm size, you would need to know um, that if you don't. So. We're going to just use this tool, and I'm going to mark this. You guys have hopefully seen how to do this. I know Cindy Rosa has a video out on it, if you have it. parting tool and we're just going to start working our way in. And I'm doing a double pass, so a double width to give myself some room here, even a triple width so I don't bind up the tool. And we're turning at 1100 RPM and we're still getting rid of the drop of it. Oh, come on. Can't do that. So we're just, uh, we just knock it loose. My the edge of it as a tool to see how deep I am. You can also see, it's good to stop the lathe, you can see that even though I went double width because of the height on it, it's going to start binding up on you so you need to go a little wider even. Um, otherwise, you can switch over when you start getting that far in. This is a diamond point and I can widen the hole up a little bit with it. And I'm not fighting the width of that one. The 
it's still getting tight though. It's still starting to bind up, so we need to go a little wider. So here was one thing you need to think about a little bit here would be if you're going to make that pendant that's going around, this piece that's in here, the back part of it is going to be that pendant. So if I go, the further I go in with this tool, the smaller that pendant becomes in the end. But at the same time, we have to be safe. We need to get this done in a safe manner. So shrinking that pendant a little bit is not going to hurt it at all. So I would advise you shrink it. So we're going to go in and take a little bit wider path. Give us some more work room. So I'm not binding up the tool. I'm working both sides of the hole to keep it the same width. Check it where we're at. We still got another eighth of an inch. We're probably pretty close. If you had a bigger jam chuck back here, a glue chuck, um, you wouldn't have to worry about it coming off. But because of where we're at, it's probably going to come off of here when I cut through it. Which is okay, as long as it goes that way. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing here to think about, right here would be your prime opportunity. Uh, the one that's got the core in it. So if I wanted to put a core in this one, I don't have the core up here. If I wanted to put a core in here, I need to start sizing it for that core. Can you grab that core for me? So I would have compensated to begin with, I would have thought about my core width, and I would have wanted to be a little bit under this size, and I may or may not be, we're fine. So now would be the time that I want to size it to fit this core. And I'll show you how to use this tool later to, for sizing for a core. And we can, it makes it really easy to get this this parallel the whole distance but now would be the chance to do that if we were going to use a metal core we would put that in there and we would size it to fit that now would be the time since we're not going to be using the core I uh, and I'm, I'm going to be mounting this with on my chuck later to turn both sides of it it doesn't matter we don't need to clean anything up we can continue on when I first did these in the beginning I would cut it to about where I am and then I would get my final size, and then I would size my outside, and I would sand this whole side up right now. And then I would reverse chuck it later into it, so I didn't have to turn it around on my chuck later. I found that you don't have to do that now. You can get this done, we can set it to the side, and I can still do all that later. It's just a two-step process later. You'll see what I mean shortly with that. So we're going to take it off there now. Hopefully. You're ready to catch. You've got a tool in there. It's just going to hurt it out. The tool in there is going to take a while. Let's just go like this. Let's just try. So if you listen, you can hear different noises. Pretty close. Smell glue. Mm -hmm. Oh, and just to pop the hole. Nope, there we go. Perfect. Okay, so there's our core. We'll work on that later. You can set that to the side. Uh, oh, next thing. So now we want to side the inside of our ring. How much time do I have? 7.15. And we have to what? 8.30. 7.15. An hour, hour and 15 left. Uh, oh, we got all kinds of time. An hour and 15 minutes. We got time. <clears throat> awesome. Um, so, uh, I guess we need 
to decide if we're doing a one piece or a two piece. We could do a one piece for ease, I guess. Uh, so here we're going to drill it. We're going to pre-drill it for the core. And I just want to make sure that the drill bit is smaller than the diameter because I'm going to come back in with this boring tool later and clean it up. You're a little loose. I know. I see that. Thank you, though. So here, we have to think about this. The width of this ring is that wide, which means that I can go in, if I go in much further than that, I wouldn't get a pennant out of here. So we don't want to go too far with this bit or we lose our pennant possibility. Or we could get a smaller band. Um, or we could not do a pennant. I think we're going to be all right. So the width of this bit, we want to go just a hair over it. So let's go ahead and drill it. Scientific term. So when you're drilling, uh, any of our blanks, I recommend you're a 600 RPM. Let the bit find center. It's nice and slow. Back out occasionally. So we want to go just a little bit over that. Okay. That's pre-drilled. This is called a boring head. So let's talk about the boring head. So I did Two dozen rings without one. You don't have to have the boring head. You can definitely do it. It makes it more of a challenge. Um, and what happens is, to make it more of a challenge is, is that for the core to fit properly, it needs to be a parallel hole. So that becomes your problem is, for one, you got to get it sized to the right size. And second, it needs to be parallel. If you're not parallel, when you cut it, it's either too big or it's too small, and it either won't fit on the back side or you've got a big gap on the back side. So to do it without it, without the boring head, you're going to learn to come in and watch your bed rails and try to be parallel with your bed rails and try to keep it parallel. The other thing you can do then is when you think you're getting close, is take your calipers and use your the sides on them and actually insert them in a hole and get down here with some glasses on and a good light and actually see if there's a gap or if it's if it's holding it out you'll see a gap or you'll see the gap on the front or the back or it fits perfect so that's the way i did them without them for a long time and it does work the issue becomes also when you're going in with a small ring and you've got a big parting tool and you're trying to keep that hole parallel, you're going to find that the top of the tool will actually start hitting and it pushes the tool around. So it almost becomes impossible on a small ring to use a tool like this. <coughs> I wound up, and I shouldn't even say this if this is going to go on YouTube, but <laughs> I wound up taking a, a quarter inch or a 3 16th inch wood chisel, a wood chisel literally a wood chisel, and grinding it to where that it had like a 10 degree on it. Then I was able to use it. The key is you've got to have your tool rest all the way up as close as you can to go in because you don't want that to overhang over a half an inch or so where you're asking for trouble. You're going to break that tool. So it's kind of risky to do something like that, but it does work. So if you can't afford a boring head, there's ways to do it. Um, and that's how I did them for years with, with that. Lid tool. box? Box tool to, to fit the lid on a box? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Would work, would work really 
Well, because it's shaped similar to that yep. uh, bit that you're boring it. A badan might work okay too. Um, if, if, you, if you can drill it big enough to fit the badan. If, if it's got you might have to grind the side of it, but there's ways to do it if you have the will. Uh, this boring head, I got it because I was doing quite a few rings, and again, because I, I supply blanks to the supplier that had this, so, <laughs> so it was kind of a trade-off. But um, it? it comes from ringsupplies.com, this particular one does. You get the whole set, you get everything that's here, it comes in actually two pieces here. This unscrews, so you can actually put different heads on it if you were really that inclined. Um, this particular one is made in Germany, so the tool steel in it is pretty good. It is carbide, and it comes with all this here, and it comes with, uh, let me get this threaded back on, it comes with nine different cutters. Uh, they're different sizes, and it's good um, if you're doing bigger stuff. These are the nine cutters it comes with. Just put them right on the top. Right here. There are, you can see they're all different lengths from that little bitty one all the way to this one. So uh, obviously the, the deeper you're, you're going out, the heavier duty, the bigger you want to get. Um, and the other thing with this is that the, this tool has two different positions here. I can insert the cutter over here. So I can start out in the center working my way out. And when I got too big for it, I can switch it to this hole and I can work my way out further. I think it'll actually do, and I'm not positive on the size, I'm going to guess two and a half inches or something. Does it go wider even when it slides yes. in the dovetail? Yeah. So to adjust it, we're adjusting it right here. So this is moving, if you watch right here, it's going to move, or right here, sorry. It's going to move that cutter head that way. So you can see that it'll move it off center a long ways. So here's center. I'm an inch and a half over center. You probably got a three inch diameter you can cut right now. Um, so it's kind of a nice cutter that way. The other thing with it is, is that, and I've never used it, but you also have, if you were doing a big bowl or platter or something and you felt the need you can always come in here too so you can actually mill in to the inside too you you have to bore a hole in the middle first for this to clear it and then you can work from the smaller bits all the way to the bigger ones and you can keep going with this so it gives you a bigger diameter it, it's a lot to play with on it it is crazy um, if you needed that precision, I mean, it's a great tool. The only thing I use it for, honestly, is this, and I might use it on a lidded box if I was really trying to get a nice fit. But I've got that dialed down without this. I don't use it for that. Um, anyhow, it's a nice tool. Uh, they're $130. They're kind of pricey um, for this particular one through ringsupplies.com. That being said, eBay. I've seen them on eBay for 60, 70 bucks. Uh, um, even from a couple of, uh, what was that one place? Um, Little, Machine Little Machine Shop has them. I think they're 70 something dollars on eBay or 80. Well, eBay, they're 70, but they don't come with the cutters. Okay. Little Machine Shop comes with the cutters and a nice plastic box with everything, molded plastic and everything fits in. Uh, this is just like your carbide cutters at home. You can sharpen it with a diamond. So. If you've got a diamond card, you could sharpen it. I don't think you're ever going to need that, honestly. You, man, you'd have to do, unless you hit something, a rock or something. Um, I bet you could do 500 rings without ever needing to sharpen it with just one of the cutters. So this cutter's kind of nice. We'll go back to showing you how to use it right now. Uh, we're going to use it to keep our hole parallel. And here's our adjustment again. You can see that it's labeled here in uh, one, one one hundredths we determined, right? Mm -hmm. Hundredths. Hundredths. Point oh one <clears throat> is one one hundredths, yeah. So it literally I can move it one one hundredth at a time. And you'll see when we do that that it's literally taking 
uh, shaving the size of your hair off almost. Um, so the, the three Allen wrenches up here that you see, they lock your cutter in place, whether you're using this hole, this hole, or this hole. Uh, that's what those are for. These three up here lock this in place if I needed to move this and then I could lock it down to where that there's no vibration. I don't use this one. I have found no need to. I don't get any vibration not doing it. That locks your... It, it locks this, this mechanism from turning is what it would do. And I can show you that right here. So if I tighten any one of these three, it'll lock this down. It won't move. Well, I didn't think it would. I guess it does. Hmm. All right, then I don't know what that one does. I thought it locked that in place. It probably lessens your clearance so you can... It just makes it tighter so you can get just a fine knife. Is that what it's doing? Okay. Yep. Yeah, there, it locked it in. I just got tighter. So it does lock it in. You just have to get tight on the Yeah, paper. you do. I haven't messed with them. I just leave them a hair loose, and that allows me, allows me to go ahead and completely move this as I need it. When we pre-drill this, it has to be small enough for the bit to fit in. Big enough for the bit to fit into it to begin with. So I drill this with a half inch hole. This would be really close to hitting. Uh, if I went to a 3 8 it wouldn't have worked with that one. I've been using this one on rings. I find it works pretty good. You'll see that the cutter head is shaped, is up just like normal, like we would be cutting with a normal tool. And I've got it uh, the cutting edge facing towards me, which is what we want right now, because we're going to feed it this direction. So we're going to move it over until it's just about to hit. There it'll hit. That first cut should hit. And we can start the lathe. And again, we should be at, you know, now we should be back up to a cutting speed. So. I was cutting at 11, 1200 RPM. And I'm not far enough in. And if you listen, you hear it? That little noise that just bottomed out. So I could continue on and I could make the hole deeper. So you need to listen for that, otherwise you're going to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper each hole and pretty soon you can't do your pinning. So listen for that noise and try to stop right at that noise. So that was that cut and we're going to keep going and I'm just going to go, let's see here. I usually move this up so I can see it. Okay, here's one one hundredth of a thousand, or one one thousand hundredth, I can't even say it. One one hundredth. It's also important to make sure you're holding it in tight here. You've got to hold it in tight. Does it come with a draw bar? It does it not. Draw bar? It does not. It is drilled for one though. So that was one one hundredth and I can see that I'm actually cutting but you can't even see a shaving. But if you were doing a brass or... Now that's ten one hundredths. If you were doing a brass or a, some other parent metal, which that cutter should be able to cut. Yeah, you would want to do that one one hundred. You would want to cut it small. Like Absolutely, that. and you slow feed rate. So, uh, so it's a slow feed, high speed, I think, with metal lathe. Yep. Anyhow, uh, I'm not a metal lathe guy, but now we got to start checking. We've got a long way to go if we're going to use this core, and I need to make sure that we can use this core with my clamp for this. Ooh, that's close. We can't. So we'll do it differently. Did you get all your inserts back? I did, and I'll use one of them if it comes back up here. So the other thing to re remember with this tool is the positioning. I've got the cutter in here right now. Again, cutting edge up facing me. Perfect. Thank you. This one. You're cutting at about nine o'clock. Exactly, at nine o'clock. Uh, if I rotate this down, that's not going to do me nothing. 
It's not going to advance it when I move it here. But it will, but it's going to be such a minute amount, it's not going to be that 1-100. You're pushing it, you're, you're moving it barely side to side. So you'll find that, watch, we'll do it right here. Okay, we'll see, watch. So here we go, we're caking our cut, right? We we'll bottomed out, we we'll come in here. Basically the same, it just cleaned it up a little bit. Okay, let's move it one one hundred. That was a little over. A hundred is a nothing. It did cut it, but barely. I don't think it's feeding that one one hundred though. It's feeding it at an angle, so it's not the same. And if I turned it the other way, I'm just asking for trouble. It's not going to cut worth a. Yeah, and it's going to grab. Well, why not? Because it's, it's cutting up. No, it should be the same thing. It's cutting Yeah, but it's going to want to grab it and pull it towards me, I think. No? I don't know. I don't try that. I don't experiment with that. I just know that in this position, because it's spinning, it works perfect. And you're the same distance off-center, whether you're at 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, or 12 o'clock, it's still going to, because you're cutting off-center, it should, should cut the same. And that's a possibility. When I first tried it, I was using it with the cutter position down, and I couldn't get control of it right. It just didn't work well for me, so I started doing it this way. I'm doing 10 100ths at a time right now, and I found that it really worked good for me. Now, I'm going 10 at a time. You're moving it over the but are you moving it in the mortise? Or are you moving it on your screws? The, 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 He's moving the dovetail. The silver part. The dovetail. Understood. The silver part. Which, so but it's see, going from okay, center so the out. Dash, whatever, is it moving? So he threaded that on his truck. Right. And then he's moving it back and forth. That is going to give you more play. It's moving right here. It's giving, no, no. He's just saying you don't have it bottomed out on here. Oh, no, it is bottomed out on this. It's not moving here at all. Well, I, actually, I am moving it there, but it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. That gives you too much play. Right. Yeah, it should That's be tight. That's exactly what I was saying. You should move it in the mortise, not at this exactly. screw joint. Exactly, and that should be tight. Because that'll give you a slop more yeah. than... You, you are absolutely the, correct. Okay. Make sure that is tight. What I think you could do is just leave it vertical the way you can easily see the... The scale. You could, and that's that. what I did to begin with. I should, thought, okay, this is how I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to cut like this. And I can tell you that it didn't work as well as you thought. That's For whatever sense. reason, you, you want. Turn your cutter, would it be the same direction? Yeah. See, it's cutting less. That it was the same matter. tin, it and it cuts it less. It doesn't cut tin. It's got to be the same. <laughs> Anyhow, we're not going to argue over that. <laughs> that's a discussion that we can have later. Where is that over a beer. Over a beer. Woo! <laughs> so now we're already too big. Oh, you're too big. So we went too big already? No, we're not working. We're done. We're done. <laughs> the good news is you have another one. You have other cores that are bigger. <laughs> but I don't have any that are two piece. But we have a our one piece. I have two piece. Let's see if this will fit. Oh, look at that. That's a little bit big still. Robert, you measure the inside of the core with the calipers. You can use the calipers as a I'm, you can. I fall it a bit closer than this guessing. And that's the biggest one I have. And we're going to make it work, I think. It's a hair big. So I can tell you this. The next thing is when we're, when we're actually sizing this, if I wouldn't have been yakking <coughs> the whole time, we would have got this sized right. But when you're sizing it, you want to be just a little bit bigger than your core. If you make it to where you've got to force the core in, when you glue it in, you squeeze all your glue out. You've got to have a little bit of slop there for the glue to adhere. This, in my opinion, you can see it's moving at 30 seconds. That's a little bit more than I really want it to. Because Could you use an epoxy, uh, like a urethane? Like a, a Gorilla Glue would, would expand and do work there, yeah. 
but for a CA finish, or for CA, which we're going to do today, it may wind up with some gaps in there, and if we wind up with gaps, then that's going to be a bad spot that it wants to break at. So we can still do it with this core, it's just not going to probably be ideal um, for selling a ring or for so making it. Medium thick CA to get a little bit more. Yeah, or an epoxy or a Gorilla Glue, glue is what I would probably use. Whenever I have a get big gap on my pins, I use a Gorilla Glue. If my drill bit wanders or anything, absolutely. So, we're so, done with that cutter. Did everybody understand the cutter though, what we were talking about with it? As far as how it works, um, besides the controversy on the directions. As long as we did, we'll move forward. Um, and I'll go ahead and pass this around. Be careful that edge is kind of sharp on the cutter. I think I know why you're getting a little bit of variance from horizontal to vertical. Is uh, if the lock on the quill is not quite tight, but it's just kind of snug, moving in and out, right. it prevents the quill from going back and forth like this. Yeah. But there is no lock on the top, so you have probably more play on the top. Right. Could be. It could be. I just know that I tried it that way to begin with because I thought, oh, this is cool because I can just keep it up here where I can see it. And I did it that way. And the first couple rings I did, it just would not advance right for me. And I don't know, maybe it was just new with the tool. Could have been. The next thing here, we've got it parallel. We've got it a little bit bigger than the hole we really want. Um, but I think we'll be all right. We need to, next is we need to size it. For this, I put the core together, and you can do this a couple ways. You can use your calipers, you get the inside of the channel, and you can just keep marking it right here to transfer it, or I'll show you how I do it usually without them. Uh, we need to get it down to about an eighth of an inch here. We can start getting rid of some of this bulk that we don't need anymore. Oh, on the outside? On the outside, yeah. So you don't part it off until you're... Until I get it a little bit further. And then we'll part it off. We'll go back to a thin parting, or a, yeah, we'll go back to a parting tool. Speed up again. And now I'm going to just do that 30 seconds at a time. I'm going to go down to about an eighth of an inch or so. Listen to the vibration. You're pushing pretty hard if you're hearing it. Either take a smaller bite or don't push quite as hard. Just go down. Remember, we just got glue holding it. like the Easter Bunny cave. <laughs> and all that grass for Easter egg. You have about 35 minutes. Okay. We'll move on faster then. So we're uh, we're plenty big now. I can go ahead and start parting this off. That's talking a little more working. So I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to guess. About where my core is and I'm going to look. Wow. Just a hair too big. And that's just a hair big on the width, which is what we want.
So the only reason that's in there right now is to catch this. Okay, uh, two ways to do this now, uh, Craft Supplies USA has a kit that you can use your pen handle on, and it's a bushing set, they have three sets of different sets of sizes, probably won't fit this one, yeah it would actually, uh, so you would turn it just like you would your pen bushing, a pen. So that's what holds it. So that's the, the cheapest route. These bushings are, I think, four or five bucks for a set. What are they made of? They made that HGM stuff? They're plastic. Uh, um, so you can do that, or if you are going to do a lot of rings, you can buy manual. Uh, Where's the tool lock? There's a knob. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Knob. There you go. Can't find my wrench. Uh, the nicer way to do it, if you have the money, is to buy mandrels uh, that holds it. This is a collet chuck. They have these in. Uh, four different sizes, again, craft, um, not craft supplies, ringsupplies.com. Um, they have half sizes and full sizes. So you need to make sure you're using the one for the appropriate. That one. Uh, the nice thing about these ones is if you had to come back and refinish a ring later, uh, it's pretty easy to slap it on here and just... Um, get it to turn true right away, right back at the same it's spot. That might be the wrong size. It shouldn't be that tight. Uh, so they're half sizes, or they're full sizes on this. They go from, um, I think, 4 to 11, I want to say. Um, I do prefer these ones over the other ones, but the other ones will work if you're just starting out. Yeah, this is the right one. The next thing that we would do here, so we're going to use this to turn it, is we would glue this core on, and we've got to unskip that step. If I can get this one closed. Can you just start with one of the ones I brought off? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, normally I would glue this on and let the glue set and I'd work on the bracelet. But since we're running out of time, Ed's got one that's already. Four to five minutes. So normally is all I would do is this port that cord on you have 45 minutes already. Because what I would have done was I would have took this over to a sander and made sure it fit in there perfect. And it actually does. <laughs> so that's actually a hair loose on that side. So it wouldn't have probably been a good ring anyhow. I try to usually cut this off just a little bit thicker. And then you can use your disc sander at home or a disc sander here and just barely touch the side of it up to clean it up to fit inside your core perfect. And that works pretty well. Uh, and then I'm gluing it in place. Ed's already got one for us. Glued up.
In this case, this is a single, it's not a split core. And you don't have to go too high, too hard with these. They hold more than you think. Those are the Chinese cores. The Chinese cores actually don't come in uh, size and half sizes. They come in quarter sizes. Oh, really? So it's like eight and a quarter, nine and a quarter, and a quarter. So if you have a mandrel like that, you might have to put a piece of blue tape on it just to open it up a little bit. And they're comfort cores, so they're rounded. So we just glued it up, it's dry, and then we come back and we can start turning it now. The thing here with this is going to be, uh, with this, this isn't a split core. So the way he does his is he's done the, the core, the blank is actually wider than the core. So right now is when I'm going to true it up to the blank, to the core. So I've got to get it parallel on the sides. That's why it's wobbling right now. Um, and then we can start working on the dimensions. So we're going to go ahead and just work the sides down. I can work the other side easier. Now, when you're putting it on there, in the steps, do you find that the, the mandrel, when you push it up against the step, is pretty true? And Absolutely, perfectly true. You can feel it hit hard against it and be in the right place. Your ring's not doing this. No. You could use it too. Um, I just like to take little bites to the least aggressive. And this is a spectra fiber. Okay. I think. So I want to be kind of not too aggressive. Chip out on the corner, so kind of watch that a little bit. So is that 
stabilized? Or no? So you have to let it to the stable. That's the way it came. So if you didn't know, you would you could uh, saturate it with the planet at some point in the turning to help. Yeah, and now would be a good time to do that. Yep. So. Like Robert stabilizes all his lines, I stabilize mine, so I normally don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Proper use of the skew. Yeah, the improper use. Negative brake scraper. Next, nobody can see. I like skew. I like skew. I like skew. I love skew. It's my favorite tool when I'm using it not like this. After I watched an Alan, it really made me debate whether I wanted to round that one over or not. <laughs> I really like this gear. That's probably about how far I would go down, uh, and I would probably start sanding it. And I'm not going to go through the sanding, you guys don't need to see that. So if I don't have tool marks, uh, I would start at 400, somewhere in there, especially with the plastics. If I don't have tool marks, I'll start at 600 even, um, wet sanding. And rounding your corners over, and then um, if you're going to put a finish on it, I would go to 1,000 grit, and then I would put my finish on it then. So either a CA finish or a, a friction polish would be good. So the ones that have the step on it, the, the rings that have the step in it, mm -hmm. you go down and... and just kiss the top of that. To I do. I touch the top, top of the metal. Right? Yeah. And then you would sand all that to get a polished finish on that on the yes. steel. And then you'd put a try to... So it's not like on our pins where we're building up a big thick layer of CA. Right. You can't do that on a split core. Because you're going to build that up on the metal and it's going to show on the metal. So if you're going to do a CA finish on a ring, you're basically penetrating the wood with the CA. You do two or three coats of thin CA and you're done. You, you, now that the wood, the wood in the blank is, is absorbed all that CA and you're polishing that CA that's in the wood. So now you're going to take that CA off of the metal. So I even actually take my skew and uh, my wedding ring that's going around wherever it is and I, I rounded it. So I cut into the stainless on each side and rounded that some to get the CA off of it. And I like it with a little bit of a round, slight radius feel to it instead of square. It feels better on your finger. It's not as sharp. It doesn't cut in. And it gives the blank a little bit more meat in the center so it's not as fragile <coughs> to try to break it, in my opinion. So that's why I do that. Anyhow, so this would get a CA finish or whatever I'm doing with it uh, and then be done. And um, take it off, and that's the finished ring. Then the next thing would be we would work on the bracelet. And I'll kind of quickly go over the bracelet with you. Pendant. How much time? Pendant. 10? 35 minutes. 35 minutes. Oh, 35. Yep, Good. 35 minutes. <clears throat> yeah, so. Uh, I made myself some spacers. And when you pull this off, when it comes off, you can see that the back side where it was attached, a lot of times will chip out. So I try not to attach to that side first. I try to attach to the side that's got the nice crisp square edge where we, where we took the time and uh, faced that off and cut in straight. So that side goes down and in here it's just a barely tight. If you go too tight you're going to snap the blank. The spacers hold it off there and it gives you a little bit of room to work.
We can check our inside size and see if we're good. We wear close enough to where we want to be. It's pretty close. So it would just be a matter of cleaning this inside up uh, with a tool. I can probably go in just a little bit. I've got a pretty good sized line in there. And then we can start shaping this outside. So. It's it just moved. <clears throat> it just moved. It's loose. What's loose? Yeah, it. Oh. Well, that didn't work. Try that again. It's easier if you do it with a chuck off. Right Ed? It was okay, the ring you made her, she was happy with. Yeah. You get it out? Yeah, you went far enough. If you're doing a hybrid blank, um, <coughs> if you're doing a hybrid blank, at this point I would have flooded that wood line with CA to literally help strengthen it. Um, you can also use a jam chuck if you prefer. It's just about as abusive as this. I used to make them with just a wood jam chuck and jam it on it. And that works too. Have you um, thought of, of compression it? You can. Yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, that's another way to do it. But I like to be able to work the whole outside of it and get my finish on the outside. The inside, it doesn't have to be that nice. It's not that critical part. I like to shape these out on the outside and it makes it harder to do that for me. But you could do either way. So it's nice light touch again. For me, the lightest cut I can use is that shear scrape. Run it nice and true. You see how well those are holding right here. To begin with, I've got some glue on here. get through that glue. It's a real light cut. Everything we do now is a real light cut. got a little bit of a line in here. I want to see if I can get rid of that line. Gotta watch the depth. Oh yeah, you will. You'll feel it too. I want to work a little bit over halfway though. I 
I like to round that corner off. A little bit of a sharp line still. That's probably fine. just 600. I'm just going to take out that one little line right there. Uh, normally I would use oil right here. If I start with 400 or 600 um, with any stabilized material or with plastics, I start, it, I start with oil. Um, I use a lubricant and that's why. Otherwise it clogs your paper up immediately. Um, and especially if I'm doing anything with wood in it, the oil will enhance the grain right away. So it makes any any figure in the grain pop out uh, and stand up. That's close enough for this. Um, here would be the spot where I would probably go ahead and polish it all the way down with um, uh, I use, you can use micro mesh pads. You guys all have them or if you like Zona paper, I use Zona paper. Uh, I would hit it with oil first as the first grit or two, wipe the oil off. That enhanced the grain, it was my lubricant to do that. And then I switched to water. Uh, the water uh, with the Zona paper it doesn't clog it up uh, where the oil will with the Zona. Micro mesh, it's not so bad. I used to use it with oil all the way through. What type um, of oil do you use? And that's up to you. I like BLO or uh, I started using Mahoney's walnut oil and I got to where I really prefer it because it cures. So it doesn't leave any kind of oily residue. So I would do that to this side from halfway over completely right now. And then I would flip it over. Uh, if I had a little bit more time, I'd take it off. It's easier to do it sitting here, but. Can you hold these? Yeah. Okay. okay, this one got a little wobble, so I need to do it again. You'll notice that when you turn it on, it won't be parallel. It won't be Actually, we put it back on the same way. <laughs> Never failed in a demo, right? Try that one more time. Thank you. Ran them off. Stop when you hear the crack. Or when it winds up in his lap. Five minutes? Twenty-five. Oh, twenty-five. That's good. You might even have time, a little time to show a little bit of polish in there.
carry duty, we cleaned up at 8 30. We're just yep. done turning to so start cleaning up. We have to start cleaning up at 8 30. <coughs> This is the hardest part right here. Get that from the step. Get yeah. that getting that step to line up without hitting your chuck. I mean, it, that's why I pull it out here. That's pretty good. I would probably take that down with sandpaper now. I didn't bring any oil, but we're just doing this. The, the oil I usually use is to enhance the grain, anyhow. That polish, is that what's in that can behind you? This? Mm -hmm. The Johnson Paste Wax. That will lubricate it? It will. And I brought water. I'm just going to use water. Oh, okay. Um, I brought this just because if I splatter on here, I'm going to clean the bed with it. Um, I don't want the club mad at me for rough spots tomorrow. This is just 600. Below 1000 RPM. Especially with plastics, uh, heat is your enemy. Mm -hmm. It's really bad. It'll create big, massive grooves that you've got to get out. It makes it worse. That was 600. Um, then I would switch to zona paper is what I do. If you don't know what zona paper is uh, on Amazon, it's zona micro, I didn't put that in there. <laughs> uh, zona uh, polishing paper that you want to look for. Zona? Z-O-N-A. They have two packages. You want the polishing paper. Uh, it comes in eight and a half by 11 sheets. You get six grits. They're color coded. Is that by 3M? By 3M, yes. Um, you can also buy it at hobby, stuff, hobby shops. Yep, and you can also get it at Turner's Warehouse. Um, anyhow, when you, when you, I just cut it into small squares like this. This is perfect for pins. That's mainly what I use it for. Um, and you can get about five pins out of one of these sets. So it lasts forever. I, an eight and a half by 11 sheet, I've probably done 60 pins and two or three boxes and three or four dragon eggs out of it already and I got a quarter of it left. Different grits done 
Yeah, so each one of these is a, they graded in microns. Micron, I, yeah. yeah, so I can tell you that the one, the biggest one is one, is one micron or 30 micron. Yep. That's equal to 600 grit. Or one micron, yeah, maybe it's the other way. One micron. Thirty microns is yeah. the finest. And okay, so one micron it starts at. It's one way or the other. Is it the other way around, Pat? Anyhow, uh, you get to the white one, and you're at fourteen thousand grit. Is what it equals to. So it's actually finer than your than your micro mesh. Uh, I found that with the micro mesh, I used to use micro mesh all the time for my pins on my CA finishes. Just period. And I got to where that I would uh, go through the zona paper all the way, just like I do here, or not zona, but micro mesh. And then I would use McGuire's plastic polish. Mm -hmm. This. When I switched to zona, I found it would equal this without using this. So I quit using this. It takes it a step further, uh, and it cuts cleaner and faster, and it stays clean. So it's just it's just a nice. Nice stuff to work with. I can tell you this, when you get it, it comes in, they give you the color coordinates for the sheets, right? And they're in, they're laid, they're in their order. When I cut a piece off, the first thing I do is label each one. One, two, three, all the way down. Because they tell you the dull side is the back side. You want to tell me which side is the dull side? You cannot tell on that one. So this one, I just know at a glance, I know where I'm at. So I don't have to worry about it, and I know that the, the writing on the back is the back. I've been using that stuff. My uh, jewel tool, Annie with jewel tool, gave me sample rolls before 3M brought it out. Yeah. They gave it to her because she's a rep for 3M, and said, try this, because she polishes jewelry. That's what the, right. the jewel tool is designed for. Yep. They gave it to her. She was at a woodworking show probably 15 years ago, and she's, she gave me a roll to try it, and I've been using it since, and it didn't have a name when I got it. It's good stuff. It really it's is. Not, uh, Sorry, guys. I think it's actually it's less expensive, expensive than... Uh, 14 bucks for a package? Yeah, it's less expensive than the cheap. micro. Yep. That ain't bad. Something no, like that, 14, cheap. 15 bucks? That's cheap. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Free. And if you notice when I'm doing when I'm doing bigger stuff when I'm doing bigger stuff I'll notice that it's actually pushing the slurry through the paper. So it breathes. It's like a it's like a a cloth, a fibered cloth. It's not um, it's not like a solid cloth. It's like a cloth back sand. Yeah, so it lets that it lets all that um, whatever it's slurry pass through it, which really makes it nice. So you say you can get that in hobby shops? Amazon. I got it on Amazon, or I know Turner's Warehouse carries it now. Um, I usually do about 20 seconds. I count to 20 on covering the whole surface. So if I'm doing a pin, it's from one side of the barrel to the other is one. One side of the barrel to the other is two. And I count to 20, and that's what I usually do. And it works good. And then I go up to the next one. Um, at home, I'm usually at about seven, eight hundred RPM, and I'm throwing water on you guys you for doing that here. But gravel paper towel. Yeah, there you go. Good idea. <laughs> That's why my foot's over here, and I yeah. scooted away from you, Harry. Now you guys can't see, but you can watch the screen. <clears throat> it cuts a lot faster than than your than your um, micro, -mesh. micro mesh does. Did, it's just clean. What you're doing is in a sense, because there's only five grits, six. Is six. What, six, what Clarence does is by skipping grits of the micro mesh, yes. you're in a sense we're doing the same thing right. with that. Yeah. And it polishes out beautifully. Don't it it does. And I can tell you that anything bigger than pins, if I'm doing, especially when I'm doing translucent blanks like the dragon eggs where you can see in them, uh, I do each grit like I'm doing right here and then I stop the lathe and I stand parallel with the lathe bed by hand. So that becomes important to do um, with translucent colored blanks if you want that clarity because that's the only way you can tell from one grit to the next when you got all your sanding lines out. Because it's easy on a bigger turning to get too fast with one 
and not get the, the lines out from the previous one. Um, so I found that stopping the lathe and sanding parallel, I'm putting all the scratches in parallel, right? Then when I go to my next grit, I use the lathe turning, I'm putting them back in radial, right? And I can stop the lathe, and when all the lines, lines that are going this way are gone, I know I've sanded long enough with that grit. Now I can stop, put them back in, and go to the next grit. That's how you tell. Uh, and you just get a feel for it. On pins, it's 20 count. I can tell you that. But I'm going to go through these kind of fast, and I'm not going to do the other side, but you'll see the difference. It's going to pop here. Just... Oh, it already has. Yeah. Oh, you he, can see he was it. zooming in a while ago. <laughs> it's like... I can see those lights. Mm -hmm. How much time we got? 15. 15. Actually, 14. But that's so we got plenty of time. No pendant. We could probably finish this whole one. What do you use to turn the pendant? Uh, okay, so the question is what do I use to turn a pendant? Well, I used to use, take two of my chuck jaws off and I had a block that fit in it and I would slide them back and forth and I'd do an offset pendant with it. And you can do that, but it's a pain in the butt to line them back up where you were before in your original spot. Do you follow me? So you take two of your jaws off, now you've got a slot and you make like a one by two. That one by two, or a two by two, think of a two by two, four inches long. And you put it in there and you clamp it in your jaws. If you clamp it to where it's centered, now you put your pennant on their center, right? You turn your pennant round, then if you take and loosen up your chuck, offset it a little bit, push it over to one side, now you can turn it and you're gonna have an offset pendant so it'll do that whole offset of your circle. That's how I used to do them. It's kind of a cheesy way to do it. The other way to do it is I just bought this, and I haven't done one yet, because I just bought it, is this is essentially what we just did. So there's our bracelet. Here's the cores that this fits already. I'm ready to part it off. Once I part this off, this is Ruth Niles off-center chuck. Mm -hmm. So I can basically unscrew it here um, and offset it to one of these holes and gain the same thing with well, this. Put it in hole number three and then drill it. With the same thing that I did the other way here. So this is a more professional way to do it, is an off-center chuck. That runs about $80. Yeah, I think that's what Ed said he, they paid. Um, I, I got it back from him. Um, I bought it through him. He, he had a few of them extra. So I bought it through him. But um, I'm looking forward to using it. So you can see, though, we part that off. We've got that much left for our, for our matching pennant. So you can easily get a three-piece out of here. I've also done these where instead of doing a pendant, you could do a matching ring set. So you can still get a matching ring set out of here if you wanted to do it that way. Um, so it gives you a lot of options. And that blank that you, that we started with this, at the beginning, that would be able to do either two, pit, two rings or a bracelet, a ring, and a pendant, whatever, is about 20 to 25 bucks. No. If it was straight resin for the club, I would do them for 10 bucks. Oh. No. The ones yep. that were on the table. So oh, one the of these in straight resin, if it's just resin, I'll do them for our club for 10 bucks. Oh. I would sell them online for 15. Um, if you want wood in it, now it's now we're up there though. Now oh, I got to get 18 bucks or so out of it. Okay, that's what I was probably yeah. So if it's a hybrid blank, I would have to get that out. But for you guys, if you just want to do straight resin ones, I'll do just 10 bucks a piece, and you just you can even pick the colors. So tell me one week you want. Bring bring this next month for me, and I'll write it down, and we'll we'll do the colors for you in that, that color scheme. Um, I just, if you're wanting a quantity of them, then we're going to have to talk about pricing a little bit, but I don't mind doing a few a piece for you that.
Um, also at home, and this is just my personal theory. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. At home, uh, I do my count to 20, like I told you. And then I honestly will bump up the speed about 50 RPM. And I'll do another count of 10. And here's my theory with that. So, uh, I don't know what grid I'm on. I'm guessing this pink is about 3,000. Okay? So, huh? Or is it number four? Yeah, it's number four. So it's probably 8,000 or something. Yes, I think it's 8,000, 11,000, 14,000. Oh, you're Yeah, so I'm on number four. So it's at 8,000. 24 micro. Yeah, so 8,000 grid. My theory is this. The late speed does matter. If you increase your late speed, you're glancing over the surface more. You're not, you're not, in. you're not digging in as much. So it basically took that grit from 8,000 to possibly 10,000 now. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Now that's my personal theory and I think it works good doing that. So I'll advance at 10 or 50 to 50 RPM or so for a count of 10 before I move to the next one. Then I'll do my count of 20 again and then, and then I advance it again another 100. You slow it down to start to move with your grit? No, you stay at the no, but when I start sanding with my first grid, I'm at bike 600 usually. So by the time you get done, you're close to 1,000. Yeah, 8,000. The next one's 11, then 14. Yeah, so I'm at 11,000 right now. So, and, I, and I'm at, you know, 800 RPM. So we're somewhere around 11,000 grid. So 11,000 is 25 microns or 24 um, microns? So we've got 30 microns, 600, 15 microns, 1,200, 9 microns, 18. 3 microns, 8,000, 2 microns is 11,000, mm -hmm. and 1 micron is 14. That was a little over. That's just my theory. I found that on my dragon eggs that I do with the trend and the big orbs, it does make a difference. It does help a little bit, I, I, for whatever reason. So, I don't know whether it's completely true or not, but that's kind of my theory with it. Six. Huh? That's your theory you're sticking to. That's it, exactly. I just know I just know it worked for me on the translucence. So if you see his orbs, you'll know that he's not pushing. You can see through them there. The other theory with it is if you never see me wipe it with this after I started with the zona paper. I have no clue what grid it is. There is no telling. I use my forearm if I've got to see if there's scratches, and I just dry it off like that. Um, Not bad. You can tell you can tell the difference from side to side, and we could do a quick test right here. I apply this with my finger. Five. Five. Perfect. I apply this with my finger. This is the McGuire plastic polish. I'm just going to touch it on the outside edge. Try to. It's going to skin over kind of turn to a powder. When it does on my finger, I start wiping it off. So this can be your final step. It's going to definitely polish it more because I didn't, normally I would take this off of the lathe already and I would take my glass cloth that I use for my glasses and that's what I actually will wipe all the water off with normally and any slurry. But this right here will do the same thing as that. So that was just the outside and I may not have went quite far enough. I didn't quite quite get it off. Let's get it to rest. <coughs> and now I am using a little bit of heat, so it's getting warm. My push. And there it is. So take that off, you guys can see it pass it around. So normally right this step I would turn it around and finish the other side. Alright. You want to just stay down there, don't you?
Any questions? And now I would work on my pen after I did that. Okay. Hold up. Is Any it? Questions?